It's kind of, I mean, the Lord gave it to me to do the trail of blood and church, New Testament Baptist Church. They're one and the same and, you know, just get a history lesson on both. This morning, we'd like, this morning, this afternoon, we'd like to talk, uh, this is lecture number two, and uh, we'll read Matthew 16, 18 here in a minute, and two other verses of scriptures, Ephesians 3, 21, and 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, which I think we've kind of covered them as well this morning, but what we want to look at this afternoon is church perpetuity. Church perpetuity. And again, lecture number two is where we're at. And this is a part one because I know it's going to be more than one part. This, we want to give a definition of church perpetuity. And this is, I know many of you may not know him, but W.A. Gerald's book, we quote from it, book on Baptist perpetuity, we read, all we Baptists mean by church succession or church perpetuity, that's what it is, is church succession, is there has never been a day since the organization of the First New Testament Church in which there was no genuine church of the New Testament existing on earth. So there's never been a time where the true New Testament Baptist Church has never existed. Now, we'll come to that because when the rapture happens, what will take place is the saints will be taken out, the church will be taken out, the Holy Spirit will be taken out. Can you imagine the chaos? You can only imagine the chaos that will be left. That's why it's so imperative that we tell people what's going to happen. I mean, be dramatic about it. I mean, you know, a lot of people, don't, oh, I don't want to hear all that gloom and doom. Well, you better hear it because if you don't hear it and make a change, you're going to have to live it. And if you have to live it, then you're going to have a lot of decisions that's going to come upon you. And if you make the wrong decisions, you're history. I mean, you're just, you're done. So I think it's imperative. People may say, well, I don't want to hear it. Well, we need to take on the attitude, I don't care what you want to not hear, but this is what you're going to hear because this is what you need to hear. If we have any concern for and love for lost people or for people in general and their souls, then we, we need to tell them this. You know, family members, whoever it may be, it's just something they need to know. I mean, I've got, we've got relatives that they don't, you know, I know, I know my one brother-in-law, sweetest guy, and he's a Christian, but he says two things you don't talk about in the family, and that's religion and politics. <laughs> he said you just don't do it. But if you don't tell them, if they're lost and you don't tell them, then see, I think that comes back on us because we're supposed to tell everybody. You know, so. so what we want to look at first is proof from the Bible. Now you're at Matthew chapter 16. Verse 18, which we read this morning in the trail of blood, but it says, And I say also unto thee, Christ speaking here, thou that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, right away we're going to get some conflict there because people are going to say, Well, see there, Peter was the first pope. Peter was a was he's the one that was the church was instituted through. Now, okay, the rock is not Peter. All you have to do is look up the word Peter. All right? In the Greek, it means Petros. It's a small stone, pebble. That's what it means. It can't be the rock. Only one person can be the rock, and that's Christ. So Christ said, upon this rock, meaning himself, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a promise. Now, if Christ promises something, I think we ought to take that as the gospel, don't you? I mean, that's what I would think. Next, we see Ephesians 3.21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Where does Christ receive his glory? Where does God receive his glory? In the church, period. You have to be here. If you're not here, he's not going to get any glory. And I just can't, and I just can't imagine the multitude of times that a church member doesn't come to church. All the excuses in the world. It doesn't matter what they are. You're not here. And not only what Hebrews tells us, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, the manner of some is, you're not even obeying that, which doesn't make any sense. 
And all you get is, I know, but. Okay, that's what you, you get. It's like talking to a young child. I know, but, you know. Well, you can go ahead and do that. But it's going to come back on you, you know. And you can leave here. You can go somewhere else. Same thing is going to happen. It's not going to change until you learn that you are serving a holy, sovereign God. And when you learn that, then he may change. But until you get that, and like I read this morning, when Peter says, Lord, we've left all. Now, we can tell that by certain church members. They can't leave all. They can't leave their children. They can't leave their parents. They can't do this. They can't do that. They didn't leave all. They won't leave all. They just forbid to do it. Well, my children come first. Well, I've always had the philosophy, and I know people don't like to hear this. You put an obstacle in front of God, and you know what's going to happen? God's going to remove the obstacle. Now, I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen. Now, I mean, that may be gloom and doom, but that's what God's going to do. You say, oh, no, he wouldn't do that. All you have to go back and read the Old Testament. Go in there and read Genesis and Exodus. See what God did. You know, what about the children that came out of Egypt? They disobeyed. What happened to them? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until all those who rebelled against God were dead. The only two people went into the promised land from the original leaving Egypt was Joshua and Caleb. That was it. That was the only two. Now, there was, I don't know, thousands, maybe millions of people that came out of Egypt. And only two crossed the Jordan. I mean, there was other children of the, you know, Israel crossed the Jordan. But of the original ones that came out of Egypt, they were the only two. Even Moses didn't get to go across. So don't say God wouldn't do that. God's already done it. He's still going to do it. You're going to be disobedient to him, then expect this to happen. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till you come. Now, many people say, oh, we're, well, we celebrate Jesus' birth. That's not what it says. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we're supposed to celebrate Jesus' birth. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible says we're supposed to celebrate his resurrection. It doesn't say to celebrate it, his death, burial, and resurrection. Because we do it every Sunday. The very means of telling people that we know the Lord Jesus Christ and he saved us is the witness that he died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's our witness. That's what happened. That's how we are alive today and born again. Where is he at? He's in heaven, sitting in the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us because God put him there and he's not up there on the cross. It's not still there. So when you celebrate Easter, let's just play, say what it is. If you celebrate Easter, that's what you're doing because what they're worshiping is Christ on the cross. He's not there. He was victorious. He took care of that. It's done. It's over with. That's what a crucifix is. You've seen the Catholics wear a crucifix. There's a difference between a cross and a crucifix, which I don't agree with either one of them. The crucifix has a figure on it. The so-called Christ on the cross. Still, he's not there. So why are you worshiping that? Why are you celebrating that? See, I don't understand that. We could get into a big, long thing about it, but Christ said this, as often as you do this, doing the Lord's Supper, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So what are we supposed to do to keep remembrance of Christ, the Lord's Supper? I mean, it's, it's plain, it's simple, and we want to, and most religious people want to make more out of it than what it is. Luke 6, verse 12 and 13 is proof from history of church perpetuity. And Luke there, Luke being the writer, and of course Christ is speaking, and it, I mean, it's about Christ and what's going on there. And it came to pass in those days that he went up, Christ, out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Remember, we talked this morning about the apostolic age. These were the apostles. Okay, he called them. There was twelve of them. That's why, and Paul was an apostle. 
He, you know, people say, well, he was an apostle, but he was an apostle. He said he was an apostle. Now, W.A. Gerald, again, says in his book, many years ago, Dr. Benedict, a Baptist historian, wrote, the more I study the subject that is a Baptist succession, the stronger are my convictions that if all the facts in the case could be disclosed, a very good succession could be made out. This quote was taken from Benedict's histor history of Baptist. Then again, Gerald quotes George C. Uh, Lorimer on and he said this, there are reasons for believing that the Baptists are the oldest body of Christians who dissent from the assumption of the Romish, Romish church, church. This is an assumption, of course. Historically, they are not Protestants. Baptists were never Protestants. For while they sympathize with the protest offered by the reformers at the Diet of Spear in 1529, was actual situation that was going on there at the time, in which this now famous name originated, their existent attendance it by many centuries. No historian can put an exact date upon the origin of the Baptists by their own admission. Gerald in his book says Catholic bishops, priests, and Protestants cannot give the beginning of Baptist. They can't. Those who will claim, and I, and I have a whole list of them. I don't know if we'll get into that or not. But I have a whole list of reformers. Protestants, Catholics, and they claim that out of their own mouth that Baptist is the oldest religion in history. So from their own mouth, they declare that. Now turn over to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2. We see the proof from characteristics. Now we, can, we, we know the proof is by the characteristics of the church itself. How do we how can we tell? Well, it's got a characteristic. Look at verse 1 and 2 of chapter 6 of Hebrews. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So this is proof. Now, some may not accept it as proof, but it is proof. First of all, we see the repentance from dead works. Faith in Jesus Christ, Galatians 3.26, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ. That's how you came about. You just didn't come back by your own wills and whims. You came about in your faith in Christ. And how did you get to faith? By the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's what gives us our faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we need to read the word of God. We need to hear the word of God. And therefore our faith will grow stronger and stronger. So it's faith in Christ that is a proof of this characteristics of this church. Baptism. It's by immersion, submersion, and immersion, Im immersion. No infants, no infants involved. And I said that this morning in the trail button. You'll see, we're going to see more of that when that happens. An infant cannot give an account of their salvation experience. They cannot, they can't even talk. So how can they, how can they uh, you know, give an explanation of how they were saved? They cannot do it. The only people that can be baptized are those who make profession of faith, and an infant cannot make a profession of faith. Luke 7, 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. They were baptized. Why? Because they believed. They believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Then we see the ordinations. And this is failing, by the way. This isn't happening much anymore. But it's a laying on of hands. There's a reason for that. It's a laying on of hands. When, you, when a man is ordained, then what is he? The, they call in a group of preachers, which is called the presbytery. Okay? They bring them in so they can question the candidate, the man that has been called to preach, and the church is wanting to call them as pastor. So they need to be ordained. The only way they can be ordained is if the elders come in or the other preachers come in and they question that individual. It's their responsibility to do that. Then it's their responsibility to recommend or not recommend that person to that church. But the church, they do not make the decision. They either recommend or don't recommend this person. They can't say, yes, you need to ordain him. They can't do that. They just say, we feel that he has answered the questions faithfully, truthfully, and we, we would be subject to his ordination. But they can't do it. The church is the one who actually does the ordination by the by hearing what the preachers have to say, by um, their determination of what they have found out in the questioning that they have. Mark chapter three and verse 14. And he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Then Acts 14, 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So they recommended to the church there in Acts that these men were qualified to be ordained. And the church is the one who ordains them. Then normally that the church that ordains them is the one that calls them calls him to the to be their pastor. That's how it usually works. Now I only know two cases. Well, I know three, but the one um, I don't believe was done at all. Period. And um, but I've only know two other cases because I inquired about it. Has a man ever been? called to be the pastor of a church that never was ordained by a presbytery. And there was two. One had been previously, but then they found out the church was in error, so that would null and void. But they were already questioned. So the church in question that wanted to call this person as a pastor, they went ahead and called him because he'd already been through the questioning part of it, and they knew that. So they or the, the church ordained him. The other one... The deacons, they had deacons in the church at that time. And there was enough in the congregation that they ordained, that they were the ones who questioned him. And they went ahead and gave their, their okay that he was qualified to be ordained by the church. That's what they did. But there was no presbytery. Okay, there was no group of men that was called in. The other one I know of, they didn't have anything that I know of. And those that were in the church weren't, uh, what's the word I want? They were not, um, I don't think they were qualified because I don't think they really knew what was going on, what they needed to do. And the church just called him as their pastor and that was it. And he never went through the ordination, any kind of ordination. The laying off of hands is no more than a blessing. Is when you go up, You've seen, you've probably been to some and you go up and you see that the other preachers, they go up and put their hands on them. They usually whisper something in their ear. Usually it's just some word of encouragement to that, that individual because they've already questioned them and basically given him their blessings, you know, that they, they agree. Now, there are some that have tried to backtrack over the years I know of uh, to men who um, they, after they went home and thought about it, they didn't feel it was qualified went back to the man, told him, and they, they wouldn't, he wouldn't resign or he wouldn't step down. He just went ahead. And, of course, then that person made havoc of the church. And they know that they had recommended to the church to ordain a novice. And that's why we need to be careful. 
Then there was another one when I had made mention of, and I told Brother Ray about it today, that they actually, they went in, and I was told by some of the ones on the Pressbury that he wasn't qualified at that time, but the meal was already prepared, the caterers were already there, everything was all set in order, tables were all set and everything, and they couldn't say no, so they went ahead and ordained him. And today he doesn't believe in the head covering, and he believes in uh, post-trib. So, you know, these are issues that uh, I take issues with. And we're not careful anymore. That's why we're getting, uh, you know, kind of in trouble with uh, the preachers that are out there right now. They've not been scrutinized enough. It's hard. It's a hard thing to sit there and be questioned by preachers, you know, and trying to give the right answer. And hopefully they're the truthful answers. First Timothy chapter two and verse seven. Paul says, where, where unto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, there he says it again, he's an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, I lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So he was letting Timothy know what to expect and what was to be done. And then we see that the characteristics of this church is the resurrection of the dead. Look at Acts, uh, Acts chapter 24 and verse 21. This is where Paul is before Felix. And he's telling him something basically he already knew, but he says, chapter 24 and verse 21, he says, Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysus, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And it got to the place there that what happened was Paul ended up appealing to Caesar and Festus um, basically told him, if I got that right, that Festus told him that if he, uh, hadn't appealed unto Caesar, he would have been let go. But he was a Roman, and that's why he made the appeal, thinking he would get out of it. So uh, it was a, quite a turmoil what Peter, or what Paul, excuse me, what Paul had gone through. And he just was, just had some issues there. But um, basically, Festus knew who he was. And if I'm not sure, sure but uh, the one there, um, he was against Paul. The other one was for Paul. And he would have been let go if he hadn't, like I said, hadn't appealed to Caesar. But this is what he was, and, and this is what he was being accused of, is teaching and believing in the resurrection of the dead. And um, Paul was a um, Pharisee, and that's what the Pharisees believed. And so he wasn't saying anything that they didn't believe. It's just that they wanted Paul out of the way because he was preaching Jesus Christ, and that was, the bottom of the, that was the bottom line. Then we see the eternal judgment. And this is the thing we have to warn people about, the eternal judgment. But these are proof proof that this is the characteristic of the New Testament church because most churches will not do this. They will not tell people about eternal judgment. They will not tell them. They don't want, people don't want to hear about hell. They don't want to hear about sin. So these churches, the preachers aren't preaching it, which is a sad thing because this is what they actually need to hear. But in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, 
And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake some to everlasting life and some shall to shame and everlasting contempt. So we know that there's some that's going to be an everlasting judgment, everlasting condemnation because they've been condemned already. And this is where folks have a trouble with religious folks have a trouble. It says, well, you're saying that these folks will never have a chance to be saved. That's exactly what I'm saying. They will never have a chance to be saved because before the foundation of the world, God chose his elect people. And that person that wasn't chosen in the beginning hasn't got a chance. They don't have a prayer. We don't know who they are. That's the, that's the bottom line. That's what we got to be careful of. We do not know who they are. So we have to tell everybody about it. Revelation 22 and 11. It says there, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So we can see there, there is an order. Those that are righteous are going to remain righteous. Those that aren't are going to remain in the same situation. They're defilers. They're sinners. They're never going to be changed because they can't be. Because everything or everyone that God chose before the foundation of the world, Christ died for. No more, no less. You may hear the, the term sufficiency, efficiency. Well, some hold the view that if that person could be saved, Christ's blood was sufficient. Well, that's a big if, because there is no if. That person is never going to be saved. All that God chose, he gave to Christ to die on the cross. Anyone else, he didn't. So you can't make that sound. I argued with a preacher about that and argued with him. And he says, but if I said, you can't do that. You can't say if it'll never happen. A goat is a goat and a sheep is a sheep. And you can't change that. So it's not going to happen. So there is so much. There is so much in this. So much the more to be said about Baptist perpetuity. You know, I would encourage you to try to find some you know, things on perpetuity, go in there and find out about it. I think we maybe send books out there that we have or the, the banner will have them, but you can get a hold of some and you can read it yourself and maybe it will get Jarl there and, and find out or Jarrell how it's pronounced. Uh, but this outline is just the beginning. It's an elementary and theoretically one. So it's, it, it goes on and on and on. There's so much more about the perpetuity of the church. And we can, and we will get into that in, in, in the trail of blood because we can see the perpetuity of the church, the succession of the church. One church makes another church and so on and so on and so on. You cannot make a church come out. A true New Testament Baptist church cannot come out of the reformers. It cannot come out of the Catholicism. It can't come out of there because it's not teaching and preaching the same things that Christ taught. It's not hard to figure out. It's not hard to determine, okay, how do we know that the Catholic Church is not the church? Well, it's very simple. They didn't start till like 300 and some AD. That's one, okay? The other is on how they show themselves, what they do, how they projected themselves. And they've taken on <coughs> Babylon religion in their religion. What's supposed to be a Christian religion is, is not. And you can't, you can't do that and, and, have, and, and think you're pleasing God. So how many of these people out there that think they're religious, but religious people aren't necessarily born again people? So you can be religious, but doesn't mean you're saved. Doesn't mean you're born again. You can have all the religion in the world, but if you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ, you have no hope. There's no, there's nothing there. And God will not honor that. He'll honor his church. The Lord will honor his church. But he's not going to honor these out here that are preaching another doctrine. And, and, and chaos in the churches today. These other so-called churches out there. There is actually chaos in them. 
Because they're doing what they want to do and not what Christ wants them to do. Christ isn't even in there. And it's like, you know, we mentioned this from time and time again. We are living in a Laodicean ages. That's what happened to the Laodicean church. They wouldn't listen. In fact, all of them, all seven didn't listen. And they're not in existence today. God will snuff them out. That's up to God. All we got to do is keep ourselves clean and pure and, you know, strive to do the right thing. We fall in error, we fall in error, we just correct it. Repent of it and go on. These churches aren't repenting of it. They're not going on. They're, they're just froze right there. They're going to do their own thing when they want to do it and how they want to do it. And Brother Ray and I have been talking here lately. Brother Cockrell had made a statement. These, these churches without pastors, the church cannot function without a pastor. They cannot function properly without a pastor. So they're actually doing harm. They're actually doing no good. These people think, oh, hey, we got it made. We, know we can come and go whenever we want and do whatever we want to do. Well, <laughs> it's going to catch. It's going to catch you. You know, you be, be sure it's going to catch you. May God bless his word to your heart today.